Um, see you guys. So let's move on to the next. Slide. So there's, in terms of the objectives for today, there are going to be two aspects to it. Firstly, uh, knowledge. So we're going to learn about types of heart block, folks a bit about, but you know, thunder branch block, escape rhythms, and thick sinus syndrome. And I'm hoping that you're going to develop some skills in terms of uh, rhythm recognition. So this is a diagram showing the cardiac conduction system. And on the left hand side, you can see that the, the sinus node, the SA node, uh, is found in the right atrium. And that's where uh, it's also the, it's essentially the pacemaker of the heart. And that's where uh, your sinus rhythm originates from. Then you get activation of the atria and then conducts down to the AV node here. And then this travels down uh, into through the uh, the his bundle, his Pekinji system, and you have the left bundle branch, and you have the right bundle branch. Um, in fact, there are with the left bundle, there's actually two parts to it. It's not demonstrated here. There's a posterior fascicle that runs across here, and then there is the anterior fascicle. Okay, so that's important to to recognise that. So you've got the right bundle branch block and you've got uh, sorry right bundle branch and you have the left bundle branch and there are two branches of the left bundle. Now I've got um, a diagram here showing um, the aortic valve, sinus, sinusoidal node and AV node. Does anybody have any ideas why I've um, why I have highlighted this? Uh, if you can unmute your cameras, uh, unmute your, not cameras, unmute your um, Microphones. Anyone have any ideas? Is it to show the proximity of the atrioventricular valve? Sorry, uh, with the uh, AV node. Sorry, the aortic valve with the AV node, so that it has implications in, in the patients we see, especially the ones with TAVI and things. Yeah, absolutely. So you can see that the aortic valve is like the sit is in the center of the heart, really, um, and it's so close to the. Uh, conduction, the AV node in particular, and and, and the sinoatrial uh, uh, tract. So you can see how, if you have a problem with the aortic valve, uh, and if you have aortic um, valve endocarditis, and you have an aortic uh, root abscess, you can see how um, patients can develop first degree AV block. And if you have aortic valve uh, surgery, you can inadvertently injure the, the aortic, uh, sorry, the AV node and cause heart block. So um, this is the question I asked in the group. So how many types of heart block are there or, or can you, uh, can you, can you describe? So A, B or C, can we have a vote? Either you can do it on chat maybe. Um. Okay, so I, got, I can't see anybody doing <laughs> this. <laughs> I can't get to the chat, sorry. Oh, yes. Uh, okay, you can't get to the chat. Okay, so you say, just say what, what do you think it is. We've got C, C. Good, we've got a couple of Cs here. Great. Two Cs. Anybody else? Any Anyone think A or B? No, I don't. Okay. All right. So then the next step is okay. Can you can you describe how many types of heart block can you describe then? So I want you to get. Can you describe ten of them? More than ten. How many types of like just describe the heart block? Just just type it in the chat or or if you want to unmute your microphones. You can just shout, shout them out. You, you, you guys are right. So, 
<laughs> but yeah. I was going to go for the easy ones though first. So it's yeah, going to be for first it. degree. Yeah, your Mavis type one, Mavis type two, and then your complete heart block, and then your bifascicular, your trifascicular, your left bundle, your right bundle. Um, but then I, my brain's just stopped working after that. Okay, so I'm I'm sure I'm more, but... you just got eight there and just in one breath. That's pretty good. <laughs> so, um, any, any more advances than that? Um, can we include things like left anterior, like fascicular block and things like that? Okay, good. And the left posterior fascicular block. Yeah. And, and, and the reason I, I mentioned to you earlier about the left bundle, how it has two branches to it. So, you can have one, one of those may be blocked and the, and the other may not be. So, there's the posterior fascicle, and that can give you posterior fascicular block, uh, um, and you call it hemi block, or it can be the, the anterior. Yeah. Any more? That's 10. Ooh. Any more than 10? Um, no. I think, I, I think Michelle already mentioned complete heart block and all the usual ones, I think. Okay. So that's, can you get that's, sinus, sinus block? Okay, that's, sinus syndrome? Or? Okay. So six sinus syndrome and sinus well, block. Well, the sinus block, anyway. Okay, sinus block. What do you know? What sinus block is? I just mean that there's there's a block between um, the sinus node, um, and I I, I, um, I guess no. <laughs> yeah. Okay. I mean, it's a good guess, and I'm gonna um, put you guys out of your misery now. So, in terms of heart block, okay. The classic one is that we and this is and this is very important to know about is AV block, so atrioventricular block. When we talk about heart block, ninety nine percent of the time we're talking about AV block. Okay, and of AV block there is first degree, second degree, third degree. Okay, so I, I would so that's four that's four types there. I would say okay, and a second degree you've mentioned Mobitz type one, which is the Wenke back, Mobitz type two, non non Wenke back. Um, and then you can have other types of second degree, which can be two to one, three to one, or variable block. Then there's bundle branch block, and you've mentioned that as well. So left bundle, right bundle. Um, and then you mentioned about left anterior hemi block and left posterior fascicular block as well. And your bifascicular, trifascicular. And then I think it's, I don't know whether you were talking about this sinoatrial block, okay? So the sinoatrial node cell, they can be block of that, of that. And that can be first degree, second degree, third degree. Uh, you get type one, type two. So basically, you know, there's a lot going on there. Um, so, but you don't need to worry about sinoatrial block. The main thing you need to be aware of uh, in a clinical uh, form is a AV block and bundle branch block. Heart block can be persistent or can be intermittent. That's important to have that in your mind when you see a patient. It can have implications for the management. You can imagine if someone who's got persistent AV block, they, you would be more concerned about them uh, than someone who has intermittent AV block that you pick up on a halter monitor, you know, occurring for a few, you know, for a few, few minutes. You can have something called, you don't need to know about this. This is all extra. This is just for your own kind of uh, knowledge. You don't need to know. But you can have entrance block, okay, exit block. You can have unidirectional block, bidirectional block, um, functional block, you know. So there's a lot of different types of block. And if you come to the EP lab, you'll see a lot of that. So if you're interested to know more about this, what it means, please come, you know, join us in the EP lab and we can, t we can show you this. Um, but really, the main learning point here is that there's a lot of different types of AV block, uh, heart block, but when we talk about heart block, we're mainly talking about AV block and bundle branch block. So it's very important to recognise these. Now, in terms of um, bradyarrhythmias, um, the way that I sort of classify them is I classify them according to sinus node disease, and that and, and, and of the sinus node disease, they can be sinus sinus bradycardia, uh, although sinus bradycardia may be normal as well. Um, sinus arrest, sick sinus syndrome, or chronotropic incompetence, okay? So chronotropic incompetence uh, is when the, the, the patient has a failure to 
augment their heart rate according to their activity. So normally when we're at rest, our heart rates are low. And when we, and when we walk or exercise, our heart rates rise as a result. Um, and that's all under autonomic control. But there's some patients who have this inability to do that. Okay, so that's chronotropic incompetence. Um, then the big group is the AV node disease. Okay, um, and we've already mentioned that a few times already. First degree, second degree, complete heart block. Uh, and then um, patients may have bundle branch block. We talked about that already. And then there may be other types of bradyarrhythmias. So these typically are patients who have uh, a, a, atrial fibrillation that might be have a, with a slow ventricular response or they may have uh, atrial flutter with, with a sort of variable, con very, you know, with, with, with um, a degree of AV block resulting in, in a bradycardia. And then it's important to, to think about um, escape rhythms and escape rhythms are very important. The escape rhythm is like the, is like your, your backup safety um, mechanism to sort of, to keep you safe if, your normal pacemaker of your heart doesn't doesn't work, and that can, the escape rhythms can be of atrial, junctional, ventricular, and we'll we'll talk about this uh, soon. So the next thing here is uh, we've got uh, eight traces here demonstrating um, some of the bradyarrhythmias that we've described, and what I'd like you to do is just to go through them and to, to sort of describe what they are, um, what the uh, arrhythmia is. Or what the rhythm is. So we can start with A if you want. I don't know if you want to either, either shout it out. Everyone's on mute or you can write it in the chat. Either way. Uh, it looks like sinus rhythm, obviously, but it's, um, and it looks slow, but it can't. Anyone have any any ideas what they'd like to say what what A is? Is it just normal sinus rhythm? Okay, so it's sinus so sinus rhythm, but what about the rate? It is it is slow, so it is approximately. So what would you what would you call that? Oh, sinus bradycardia. Uh, sinus bradycardia. Yeah, sinus bradycardia. Yeah. yeah so. Yeah. Yeah, so this is sinus bradycardia. So this may be a sign of uh, sinus node dysfunction. Okay, um, but re remember, you have to always check patients' drugs, um, check electrolytes, check thyroid function. But assuming all of those are normal, uh, this is a patient who has sinus bradycardia. Okay, is it, does everyone agree with that? You can see that there's a P wave and a QRS after every P wave. Yeah. The interval between the P and the R, PR interval, is normal. Yeah. Yeah. So this is uh, sinus bradycardia. Okay, what about um, D? Well, again, it's sinus rhythm, but there's a pause after... Um, a normally conducted rhythm. Yeah. Sinus block. Sinus pause. Sinus block, sinus pause. Someone's sinus pause. So sinus pause, yes. It's a sinus pause. Uh, do you know what another name for sinus pause is? You can have a very long sinus pause. Asystole. <laughs> uh, almost, yeah. It's almost like but we have a specific name for it. Or where the sinus node is just not. So it's it's a sinus arrest. All right. 
after the sinus arrest where the sinus load has just given up. You can see that there is a P wave, QRS, and a P in the QRS. Okay, so you've got two normal sinus beats. Then suddenly, there's no, there are no P waves. So we, so the first thing you've noticed is that there's a pause. That's the first thing you've noticed. And this, the next thing you need to analyze when you see a pause is you want to look at that pause, that trace, to look for any evidence of P wave activity. Any evidence of sinus, you know, because you want to know, is this pause due to AV node dysfunction or is it due to sinus node dysfunction? So the fact here is that you cannot see any P waves. Would you agree with that? Yes. There's no clear P waves there. And, and, the, and the way that you look for a P wave is you look at, you find on the, on the trace a clear P wave, and that's what you're looking for. And you can't see any P waves there. So there's a pause there, significant pause there, sinus pause. Um, you, sometimes you may call that a sinus arrest, okay? But it seems to have ended with another sinus beat there. Okay, so what about C? A um, type two uh, secondary heart block move, it's type two, T to one. Okay, so Mobitz type 2, 2 to 1. So second degree heart block. Does everyone agree this is second degree heart block? Yes. Yeah. And we would be a bit more, we would also call it second degree AV block. We'd be a bit more, can be a bit more descriptive. Um, but yeah, second degree. Now, is it, now when you say 2 to 1 and when you say Mobitz type 2, are they both the same or are they different? Um, as I know, it's not a, it's not a wanky back. It's not a move. It's type one. It's... Okay, so that's true. And so it's not move. It's type one because um, the PR interval is not progressing and then dropping a beat. Yes, exactly. So it's not. So the PR interval is fixed there. Um, can't can't see it on that one. Um, and then there's a drop beat. So everyone, does everyone agree that there's a P wave, then there's a QRS, and then there's another P wave, pause, another P wave, and then QRS, then a P wave. Does everyone agree with that? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So this isn't, so it's not, it's not wanky back, but is it two to one or is it Mobis type two? What would you, what would you put it as? So the easy way to answer this is to count the number of P waves and count the number of QRS complexes. So there are four QRS complexes and there are eight P waves. So it's two to one block. Okay. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah, okay. Everybody happy with that? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes. yes. That's an easy way to, to work out what's going on there. So look at the relationship P wave to the QRS. So for every two P waves, there's only one QRS. So that's second degree uh, heart block, two to one. Okay, okay. what about, yeah, sorry. I just want to know, so what, so what is a Mobitz type two then? Okay, we'll come, we'll come to Mobitz. Yeah, sure. Um, so what is, what about D? First degree AV block. Yeah, everybody agree with that? Yes. Yeah. yeah. So the first thing that I would do is look at the P waves and the relationship with the P waves and the QRSs. So there are there is a one-to-one -one relationship, I would say, between the P waves and the QRS. Does everyone agree with that? Yes. Yeah. yeah. So and and then what you're seeing is that the PR interval is prolonged. So up to five small squares, um, so that's 200 milliseconds would be a normal PR interval. Okay, now um, just so that you're aware is that sometimes the PR interval can be really long. So sometimes it can even be buried with, within the T wave. So sometimes it's, it can be missed. So that's something just to bear in mind that sometimes if you have really long, you know, 
uh, you can get really long PR intervals, particularly pa patients who've had cardiac surgery. Okay, what about E? Is that like a variable block? Okay, so in, and what when you say variable, what what are you what what's what's what are you thinking? So I can see the first. So there's a P, then QRS, then there's a P bear which is not conductor, and then there's another two, one, two, three, three P bears which are conductor, then one which is not. Unless there, uh, unless the preceding ones were also three and then followed by a PV which is not conducted and it becomes variable. But if that's not the case, then it becomes a type two Mobitz. I thought okay. it might be Mobitz one. I think it's a Mobitz one. Is it? Come on, key back. Is it progressively increasing? Okay. So, um, going back to your comment on variable, okay, what you're what you're trying to say, in a simple way, is that the the, the relationship of the P waves to the QRS is not one to one. Okay. Um, yeah. Yeah, that's what you're trying to say, and you're trying to say that there are more P waves than QRSs. Yes. Would that be that? Would, would everyone agree with that? Now, when you get that situation, that scenario then that indicates that there's some degree of AV block. Mm -hmm. Yeah? But we are seeing that there is a relationship. Okay, so there is a relationship. So it's not like complete hot block where there is no relationship. And you're right in the sense that there's P followed by QRS and then a P that's non-conducted, then a P followed by QRS and then three um, P waves which are all conducted down the AV node. And then another drop beat. Yeah. So sometimes people will label this as drop beats, by the way. This, you know, when you get a P wave which is non conducted. Some people comment on that. And in halter monitors, for example, they may say drop beats. So now you know, now you, now you can see that there is a degree of heart block. It's not, it's not first degree, it's not third degree. It's, it, it's by definition has to be second degree. Now, is it second degree Mobitz type one? Is it Mobis type two, or is it some other relationship, two to one, three to one, etc.? Now, in terms of Mobis type one and Mobis type two, the distinction between Wenke back and Mobis type two, does anybody know what the distinction is? Well, Mobis one, the PR interval gradually increases. In type two, it, it stays the same. Absolutely. So are we seeing a progressive increase in the PR interval before the drop beat? So well, far, far away it looks the same, but I don't yeah. know if it, goes close, it might, have, might be increasing. Okay. So if I would say, is there a clear, in, clear and obvious increase in the PR interval? So I, I don't think I can see a clear increase in the PR interval progressively. Yeah, so it's 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 not clear. So maybe you you might want to measure it out to be more accurate, and you can do that. But another little tip for you guys in terms of how I would look at it is that I'd look at where the drop beat is, okay, and I compare the beat before with the beat after, okay, and what I'd look at is the PR interval before. And the PR interval afterwards. What you see with Wenke back is that the PR interval before is much is longer than the PR interval after. And if you look on this trace here, this PR interval and this PR interval look pretty much the same. So I would I would describe this as a second degree uh, heart block Mobitz type two. Now, we're going to skip F and let's go to G. So 
So that, that shows progressive increase in the PR interval followed by um, a non-conduction of QRS complex. So that's a Mobitz type 2. So that's Venkipak. Mobitz type 2 or type 1? Oh, sorry. Uh, Mobitz type 1, sorry. Yeah, Mobitz type 1. Yeah. Does everybody agree with that? Yeah. Yeah. Do you think this is clearer, this one, G? You can see a clear change in the PR interval. Yeah. 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 And if you follow my, my little trick, my little tip, look at the beat that's been dropped, which is this one here. Mm -hmm. Look at the beat before and look at the beat after and look at the PR interval. Can you see the PR interval before is mm -hmm. clearly longer than the PR interval after? Yeah. Yeah. This is sort of how I go about doing looking at it. And for me, I find it quite easy to appreciate the, because this is the maximum PR interval and this is the minimum PR interval. So I find it easier to appreciate the difference between the max and the minimum rather than having to look at each individual one to have a look at successive increases. In this particular trace, it's a lot more obvious, but you know, in other traces, it may not be so obvious. So just very briefly, just in terms of what's going on here about the AV node. So the AV node has this property that the more you stress it, the more it slows down the conduction. So all of us will have this point where we will suddenly drop out, uh, uh, and have a drop beat. But it usually happens in healthy hearts with a much higher rate, okay? So 180, 170, 190, maybe 200 plus beats per minute. We, we will, all of us have, we call this a wanky back point. This is, you don't need to know this, but this is just, it just makes things a bit clearer in terms of what does wanky back mean? So wanky back is this, it's, it's a property of the AV node that the, it's a bit like what someone told me, it's a bit like a, a, a toddler who uh, you try to make the toddler, you know, go quick and it just wants to slow down and, and it sort of resists you, resists you. So that's what the, the AV node does that. So as, it as the heart speeds up, naturally your PR interval would may, may increase until it, till it drops a beat. Um, but you can't see that. You can measure it in the lab, but you can't see that on an ECG. In this case, this patient has an it has AV node disease where they're getting wanky back at slower heart rates. The heart rate here is around 75 beats a minute. They shouldn't be doing that at that, that sort of rate. Okay, uh, we've just got two more left. F. Complete heart block. Does everyone agree with that? Yes. Yeah, so it's complete heart block. And the the reason is you have, the term is AV dissociation, okay? So clearly, if you look at the P waves, there are more P waves than QRS complexes. The QRS complexes in, in, in complete heart block will be regular. And similarly, the P waves will also be regular they'll just be going at a completely different rate. There'll be no relationship. Does that make sense? So the way that I look, confirm AV dissociation is I map out the P waves and prove that they are regular. And then I map out the QRS complexes and, and, and prove that they are regular as well. Okay. Um, H. See any any uh, P waves and the RR interval also is irregular. So um, looking at this trace, it may seem that this is this kind of like fibrillation of slow AF. Yeah, slow AF. Yeah. yeah. Does everyone agree with that? That is slow AF. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. right, you absolutely describe yeah. it and you say there's no 
clear P waves um, and uh, it's regular R interval, that is a definition of atrial fibrillation. So you can be clear and say this is atrial fibrillation yeah. and uh, it's a slow ventricular response. Mm. Okay. It's a slow ventricular response. Okay. So this is slow AF. Does anyone know the distinction between slow AF and AF with complete heart block? If you have AF with complete heart block, does it regulate so your RR interval? It slows down and it seems more regular. Yeah, does everyone agree with that? Yeah. So the distinction that you're right is that with, with AF and complete heart block is that you get a regular rhythm. So the QRS is a regular. But when you try to look for P wave activity, you can't find any. And it's just you just see the fibrillation waves. So that's the distinction between slow AF and AF with complete heart block. And I'm going to talk to you about why that is in the next few minutes. OK, so uh, I think that's there are the answers. OK, so here are the answers. So you got all the answers right. OK, well done. So I'm just, no, the next part, I'm just going to go through relatively um, I'm not going to quiz you guys too much from the next part. So bundle branch is very important to recognize the difference between left and right bundle branch block. OK, so uh, on the left hand and, and the way that you do that is by looking at V1 and V6. OK, so on the left hand side is is an example of left bundle branch block. On the right hand side, right bundle branch block. And the key distinction is that with left bundle branch block, you get this little R wave and an S pattern in V1, and you get this positive uh, R wave in V6. They sometimes call this William, W and M. In reality, it's not really a W, but it's a, neg it's a, a deep S wave. And with right bundle branch block, you get this little R, S, R prime, and then that's in V1, okay? That's what we call it, RSR pattern, RSR pattern. And in typical right bundle branch block, the second R, the R prime, is bigger than the first one. That's why it's a little letter, and that's why that's a capital letter. That's classical, typical right bundle branch block. So that's so this is important to, for you guys to remember. Uh, and sometimes they say this, they, say, they call it marrow in the books. Okay. Now, there is a question here. I don't know whether you'll have enough time to answer this question, but these are three ex examples of sinus arrest, where the sinus node is not functioning. And the way we know that is because there is an absence of P waves that indicates there's a sinus arrest. Um, in A, you see it's actually just a sinus pause in the sense that sinus rhythm returns again. So there's just a long delay between that sinus beat and that sinus beat. Okay. Now, in this example, can you see how you have QRSs which are relatively far, far at a faster rate? And here you have QRSs that are perhaps at a slower rate. Okay. Now, what we're seeing here is an example of an escape rhythm. And there are two different escape rhythms in B and C. In B, the escape rhythm is broad. Okay. It's a broad escape rhythm. In C, the escape rhythm is narrow. Okay. So when you look at escape rhythms, you have to make the distinction between a broad escape rhythm and a narrow escape rhythm. And I'll explain to you the reason why. Because I would be more worried about patients who have a broad escape rhythm than those that have a narrow. And I'll explain to you why. So the answer is they don't have P waves. There's no P wave being generated from the sinus node. Um, and uh, in A, here there's no escape rhythm. In A, there's no escape rhythm. Okay. 
and here there is escape rhythm. So escape rhythms are the, the body's natural way to protect itself if the sinus node doesn't function. So the sinus node rate is around 60 to 100 beats per minute. Uh, the atrial escape rate is just lower than that slightly, just under 60 beats per minute. The reason for that is you don't want the atria to be firing off in, instead of the sinus node. Ideally, you want sinus node activation first. Then the AV node has a, um, an escape rhythm at a lower rate, 40 to 60 beats per minute. And this would be uh, a narrow escape rhythm. AV node with rhythm would be a narrow escape rhythm. And then the ventricles have an escape rhythm even lower still, 20 to 40. So this is the hierarchy. So you start off with sinus, sinoatrial node activity, then you'll have an atrial ectopic rhythm if the sinus node doesn't work. If you don't have an atrial ectopic rhythm, then you'll have, you may have a junctional rhythm from the AV node. And if the junctional rhythm doesn't work, then you'll, you're left with a ventricular escape rhythm. So this happens in sequence. So with an ectopic atrial rhythm, you'll see you won't see normal P waves, you'll see abnormal P waves coming from somewhere else, another area of the, of the atria. If you have a ventricular escape rhythm, it's broad, and that means after, if, if you lose your, your ventricular escape rhythm, it means you have no other rhythm after that. And that's why you, I would be more worried about a patient who had a broad escape rhythm than that, a patient who had a narrow escape rhythm. Um, very quickly, I'm just gonna mention about six sinus node. Um, so sick sinus syndrome uh, is, a, is something that was described back in the early 70s and it's actually still pertinent today and this is an observation of some patients who have the sinus node is starting to, to wear out and not working properly and what they get are sinus bradycardia, uh, sinus arrest, they, and they may get paroxysmal SVTs um, be, because the sinus atrial node is, 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 is unstable. So they get, so we sometimes call this tachybrady syndrome, tachybrady syndrome. So sick sinus syndrome, tachybrady syndrome. You may see patients present with syncope and those, these type of patients are very challenging to, to manage because the tachycardia you want to treat with medications, but you're limited because of the bradycardia. So a permanent pacemaker is required in these patients. And this is an example from that, tra a, tra a trace from that paper, where you can see this patient has um, ta tachycardia, with, with this is, either this is some sort of atrial tachycardia or perhaps even atrial fibrillation. Then they have, you can see that this sinus arrest here, and you can see again, si severe sinus bradycardia, um, and then they have paroxysmal uh, SVT or paroxysmal uh, AF. Um, I'm going to skip on this because now we're running uh, late. So the last thing I'm going to say, a few tips, is that never rely on what the ECG report says. Often it's wrong. Always look through any 24-hour tape recordings yourself um, and use the rhythm strip on the ECG to assess the rhythm. It's also useful to look at other leads because the P waves sometimes are more clearly seen on certain leads. If you have a patient where the rhythm is unclear, either on the monitor or from a 12 lead ECG, then just repeat the ECG or perform a, a rhythm monitor, a rhythm uh, recording. And this is an example of a rhythm recording where you have multiple uh, leads recording at the same time so you can see if you only record it on V1, you get a lot of artifact and you may, you, think, you may think this is AF and you can't really see the P wave very clearly. So the benefit of having multiple continuous ECG recordings is that you can often make out P waves clearer um, in other leads. So thank you very much. Does anybody have any questions? <laughs>